I am pleased to inform you that we have arrived at the labyrinth. Please be advised that the punishment for trespassing is execution. Please be advised that electrical storms on the surface of Tartarus make departure impossible at this time. Resident count is as follows. 3,071. Resident deaths, including but not limited to executions, are as follows. 1,684. Resident escapes are as follows. Zero. The interior can be chilly. Take a scarf with you, Captain. I would also ask that you leave your captain's ID with me, in the event that you do not return. I can make the assurance that I will not leave with another captain unless you do not return within 876,541,652 hours. Oh, speak of the devil. Captain, I am receiving a transmission from the prison's docking authority now. Attention, unauthorized spacecraft. This is a maximum security installation. Your presence here is an explicit violation of UDL corporate policy. You are hereby confined to your docking platform until a ticket detailing your crimes has been filed and notarized, at which point your vessel will be seized and you will be executed. I wager it'll take a bit longer than it takes you to lose your patience and storm out of your ship looking to get shot. To be honest, that'd make my job a lot easier. You come out, we shoot you full of holes, and then everyone goes about their day worry-free. Except you. You'll be dead. All right. I'm feeling generous. I'm transmitting the idea of a productive, law-abiding employee so you can see what one looks like before you die. Anyway, Tartarus Docking Authority signing up. Hang on. Another ship just pulled into your dock. Wait, is that from the Groundbreaker? What the? Pay no mind to that. Just have a pleasant day. Transmission terminated. Biometric ID received. Transferring data to external cartridge. How can I be of assistance? Goodbye. right by what? us once. What's now it's noise? our turn. Oh, the board will never own Groundbreaker. Not hey. while I read. Push on, my guy.
Sentinel. Protect the groundbreaker! Are you new here? I didn't think we were hiring more staff. Oh, that's great. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. I'll get out of your way. Let's look around. There's got to be a few ways through here.
Let's go, troops. Stellar base counting on us. Staff. Oh, no. Don't tell anyone, please. Thank you. Something about you doesn't look right. Yeah? You're not contagious, are you? I don't want to know. Just stay back. who it is I'll be damned I was prepping the studio for our announcement and here you are as a bonus I had heard you'd taken a mechanic under your wing what's the matter girl couldn't find actual employment the captains treated me right better than any of you board folk ever have I'm exactly where I want to be and the convicts uh, the vicar you know most people, once they're out of prison, don't seem keen on returning. Oh, I would go anywhere to see you fall, sir. When you go off and get yourself shot, 
Try to avoid taking one to the face. I'll want it recognizable to show to my citizens. Haven't you heard? Phineas is working for us now. It took some doing, but employing an efficient management strategy of putting our guns to his head seems to have done the trick. Yes, he is an extraordinarily obstinate fellow, isn't he? Fine, he isn't working for us per se. Semantics, he'll come around. But that's between us. As far as my adoring citizens will know, we've turned a dangerous crackpot into a working class man. It's a miracle. Oh yes, go on, wake them up, add more mouths to feed. That'll solve our starvation problems. I don't know what half-baked plans that simpleton in a lab coat has been leading you through, but it's done. It's over. Let me ask you something, Captain. Have you at any point thought about not fucking up our entire society? I believe we could ask you the same. I'm making actual progress towards stabilization and recovery. You're just getting in the way. That's because you don't think ahead. Phineas's counterproductive plan doesn't make a lick of sense. We don't need your help. I'll admit, there's no shortage of talent in the scientists and engineers there. Look, I'm not an unreasonable man. If you manage to storm the castle, as it were, and make it out of here with Phineas alive. Oh, I can't exactly afford more havoc than you've already caused. Fine. If you survive, you'll need someone to sell the rest of the board on your plan. I've got work to do. MSI. I'm not one for rousing speeches, but the captain needs our help. So yeah, get in there and fight! Oh, oh, wait. Captain, you have an uncanny talent for complicating my life. You've been working with Dr. Wells from the beginning. 
When we moved to arrest him, he was prepared. I lost good soldiers in the attempt. You've disrupted the balance of power. You've upset the natural order of things. You've introduced uncertainty, and there is nothing I despise more than uncertainty. I'm afraid I can't do that. You have a flair for subtlety. If you'd worked for me, you would have been the greatest fixer Halcyon has ever seen. For all your talents, you are the enemy of Halcyon, and therefore you are my enemy. Hmm. You make a nuanced and compelling argument. Here's my rebuttal. No. Dr. Wells is being held in my custody. His cooperation will prove invaluable, even if I have to beat it out of him. All that's left to do is put down this riot, arrest you, and then get on with the bloody business of saving this colony. In that we are in agreement. An end to violence is precisely what I want. An end to chaos. An end to senseless loss of life. The only obstacle standing in my way is you. You were one of my finest agents once. I don't want to destroy you. Turn yourself in, and I may yet show clemency. Fair enough. I'm giving you exactly one chance to parlay with me. Interesting that you think I'm going to die here. I believe I'm more than capable of taking you on. Fair point. I don't know how you've managed to defy the odds. By every reasonable estimate, you should be dead. Yet here you stand. I've devoted my entire life to protecting Halcyon. I'm not afraid to die in the line of duty. Don't you think I know that? Yes, I made mistakes. Costly mistakes. Leaving you alive was the worst of them all. You were always an unknown variable. I tried to recruit you, but you threw your lot in with that madman, Phineas Wells. I'm aware of Dr. Wells' plan. Revive some brilliant scientists and engineers from the Hope, and work with them to save the colony. He's already revived you, after all. Fifty or sixty years ago, I might have agreed with you. But we've passed the point of no return. The best scientists in Halcyon can't save us now. I admire your drive, Captain. But I won't let you spoil my plans a second time. I haven't given up on the program yet. You've caused some complications, but I can improvise. I can fix this. I haven't lost control of the Labyrinth yet. Our security system is still operational. I can still put a stop to you. Yes, I'm quite aware of your brazen act of corporate vandalism. By the way, those test subjects you killed... They died in agony. My scientists assure me they can recover the data you've destroyed. You've succeeded in temporarily delaying our research. Nothing more. That isn't true. It can't be. You're trying to manipulate me. That experiment was absolutely essential to the program. My scientists assured me they were close to a breakthrough. They gave me their word. Damn you. You are telling the truth. My scientists have been lying to me, and I was stupid enough to trust them at their word. We're going to have to start all over again. 
All that research, all those experiments, you've sent us back decades. I don't see any reason to continue arguing with you. I know when I'm beaten. The only thing left to do is surrender with dignity. Congratulations, Captain. You've outplayed me. I accept your terms and will return Dr. Wells to your care. I just hope you've made the right decision. The fate of the colony is in your hands now. I bid you farewell, Captain. You don't know how glad I am to see you. You must have said something to get under Akande's skin. She's gone, and I don't think she's coming back. And you, you lunatic, you broke into the board's own fortress just to rescue one doddering old man. You are absolutely out of your mind, and I can't begin to thank you enough. I'm all right, thanks to you. Akande wanted my cooperation. I'm quite sure she would have beaten it out of me if you hadn't arrived. You've broken the board's stranglehold on this colony, and you saved my life. But there's still so much we have yet to accomplish. You and I are going to have to work harder than ever to save Halcyon. I'm afraid the situation is far worse than any of us ever anticipated. Earth has gone dark. We haven't received a single message in three years. There's been no communication, no signals, nothing. Two years ago, the Earth's Directorate's frigate disappeared on their way back to Earth. We don't know what they discovered when they arrived, or if they arrived at all. Earth is only an idea to us. But that idea is the bedrock the colony is built upon. If people were to find out it's gone dark, the shock could be too much to bear. I don't want to imagine what'll happen once news gets out. Let's just keep this between us for now. You mean... we're all alone out here? Really alone? I'm afraid so, Miss Holcomb. Halcyon is the only home we have left. Returning to Earth is no longer an option. We're in serious trouble, my friend. Do you know what this means for Halcyon? We can't rely on Earth for support anymore. We've been cut loose. We're entirely on our own. Yes, yes, certainly. I'll help however I can. I don't know what happened, but something must have gone horribly wrong. I don't know why Earth's gone silent. I don't even know if Earth exists anymore. We have no connection back to Earth, and return is likely impossible. We're completely alone out here. You might have heard of the Earth Directorate's frigate. Half the colony's entire military was on that ship. They were returning to Earth when they vanished without a trace. That was two years ago. We haven't heard a word from them since. Whatever happened to Earth likely happened to them. I wasn't trying to hide the truth from you, but after all you've done, I owe you an explanation. 
Yes, I experimented on the Hope's colonists. Each of my experiments ended in catastrophic failure. Each of my subjects died in agony. You are my first and only success. I didn't tell you about the others because I didn't want to burden you. My failures are my own to bear, not yours. Thank you. Perhaps in time I'll learn to forgive myself. My apologies. I need to get a hold of myself. We've far more pressing issues to worry about right now. If you have any more questions, ask me. I'll answer as best I can. Yes, we do. You've done a marvelous thing. You've succeeded where anyone else would have failed, including me. We must begin the revival process immediately, starting with the hopes of brightest minds, and then we're going to fix this damn colony one problem at a time. We're going to need a leader, and I can't imagine a better person for the job than you. What do you say, old friend? Will you help us? When I revived you, I thought you were going to help me save this colony. I was wrong. I had our roles reversed, you see. You're the one who's going to save us all. I'm just the one who set you on your path. You're the best thing to ever happen to Halcyon. If you want to take it upon yourself to lead this colony, you have my support. We're not a colony any longer, are we? Our last connection to Earth has been severed, and so we have been set free. Our future is uncertain, and no one knows what tomorrow holds. Exciting, isn't it? The OSI teaches that everything in the universe happens according to the grand plan. But the stranger that arrived in Halcyon was an unplanned variable. From the moment he landed in Emerald Vale, his actions altered the course of history. The events on Tartarus brought about the end of the board's authority. But the board's mistakes would haunt the colony for decades to come. The damage they left behind would require the work of a generation to repair. Dr. Phineas Wells began reviving a handful of the Hope's colonists. Engineers, scientists, technicians, and intellectuals. They were among the brightest minds the Earth had ever sent out into the stars. The Hope scientists and engineers woke up in a colony descending headlong into total collapse. With no way to return to Earth, they had no choice but to band together and devote themselves to the cause of saving Halcyon. The people of Halcyon were nothing if not hardy, in the absence of the board's authority, many of the colony's settlements banded together with a single purpose in mind, survival. Life was especially hard in the years to come. Some towns dissolved by attrition and starvation, but most of them found a way to carry on. In the years to come, Halcyon was forced to reckon with its newfound freedom. The board was gone, and for better or worse, the colony was responsible for its own destiny. Between MSI's worker-centric policies and the iconoclast's manpower, Sanjar and Zora were able to rally many of the Terra 2 townships to their cause. MSI's workforce swelled, and the iconoclasts enjoyed a significant surge in their ranks. The board was too distracted by infighting and internal politics to stop MSI from becoming a powerful corporation and a refuge for townships that might have fallen through the cracks. Consumed by paranoia, Lilia Hagen took sublight salvage in a controversial direction, openly accusing board officials of an extraterrestrial conspiracy. One day, an accident at the Groundbreakers' docking bay silenced her forever. Time would tell if her replacement could keep the sublight family together. Adelaide McDevitt replaced Reed Thompson as the leader of Edgewater. 
She and her followers transformed Edgewater in their image. Anyone loyal to Reed was pressured into leaving town, and those who stayed behind adapted to her way of life. Adelaide transformed the old cannery into a new garden. The nearby Edgewater Cemetery provided a convenient source of fertilizer. Under the leadership of June Lay Tennyson, the groundbreaker held firm against corporate influence. The ship's mechanical stability gave June Lay the time to educate a promising generation of engineers schooled in her family's traditions. The future of the groundbreaker looks promising. The rediscovery of the hope and the abandonment of the lifetime employment program forced Byzantium to come to terms with some uncomfortable realities about the state of Halcyon. While Byzantines were reluctant to surrender the luxuries they'd grown accustomed to, the board's diminished authority gave them little choice in the matter. Nearly everyone had to learn to make do with less. Some even had to get jobs. It was a dark time indeed. Even the Gorgon asteroid, though a distant enigma to most of Halcyon, felt the aftershocks of your actions. Olivia and Minnie Ambrose worked together to cure the marauders Adrena Time had created. Through their partnership as scientist and administrator, they discovered the harmony that had eluded them as mother and daughter. And through years of patience and effort, they discovered the means to wean Halcyon from the scourge of Adrena Time. Their work eventually allowed Wells and his scientists to treat many of Halcyon's marauders. As their addiction waned, the colonists who had lived for so long under the thrall of Adrena Time returned to their communities and loved ones and joined in the effort to save Halcyon. In spite of everything, the Gorgon asteroid remained a sobering reminder of the potential for progress and disaster in humanity's most ambitious efforts. The Rizzo's company in Halcyon dissolved after the collapse of the board. Needless to say, the launch of Spectrum Brown was indefinitely delayed. A stockpile of Spectrum Brown remains buried deep beneath the ruins of the old distillery, abandoned to time and attrition. With the dissolution of the board, Ruth Bellamy found herself without the two constants in her life, Byzantine culture and her sister Belinda. In the face of this new reality, she struggled to find a direction for her life. The colony had moved on from Halcyon Helen and would require new heroes in the years to come. And so Ruth Bellamy decided it was time to exit stage left. She quietly disappeared from public view. The dissolution of the board did not mean the dissolution of the ambitions of Cedric Kincannon, the charismatic leader of Sublight Underground. Cedric offered Slug's transportation services to the newly thawed colonists and set to work ferrying resources and food wherever they were most needed. For better or worse, Slug headgear became fashionable in the following years. As the board began to disintegrate, Spencer Woolrich found himself at a crossroads. Cling to what little stardom remained to him, or help usher Halcyon into its new future. To the surprise of many, perhaps himself most of all, Spencer chose the latter option. Having learned a variety of different skills in the many different roles played throughout his lengthy career, Spencer founded a radio serial dedicated to staying alive despite the odds. His subjects included how to survive violent encounters with only grazing wounds, dispense pithy one-liners for tense scenarios, and, of course, how to look good doing both. After a brief attempt at dating Helen as one person rather than two, which both Bertie and Helen found too strange, Bertie struck out on his own to try his hand at raising woolly cows. 
Many of his former Rangers teammates soon followed. Accompanied by the woolly cow, the team had originally plied with alcohol. The dairy farm thrived under Bertie's leadership and care. The dairy rangers privately believed that the woolly cow softened Bertie's temper considerably. Although the only one brave enough to say this to his face was promptly headbutted. Due to the board's dissolution, many of the Prophet's old customers no longer found quite the same value in productivity seminars that they once had. With her business drying up, the Prophet chose to take her followers down a new path. Months later, salvagers on Eridanos found clues leading them to a seemingly abandoned bunker out in the wilderness. Inside, they discovered horribly mangled corpses sacrificed to a blood-scrawled portrait of a sprat-headed deity. The Prophet was not among the bodies. Your influence shifted Ellie's perspective. She finally admitted, albeit grudgingly, that she just might need other people, sometimes. With a steady income from the life insurance payouts, she was finally able to afford a ship of her own. She hired a small crew and flew supply missions to communities on the fringe. Some of them were even legal. Life in Halcyon was sobering for Felix Melstone. The grand revolution he dreamed of never came. There was no great awakening for the colony, no celebrations in the streets. There was only the hard, desperate work of trying to repair a broken colony. Felix never had a head for numbers, but if there was labor to be done, he was there to help. Eventually, Felix realized that the work of a revolution was done with two hands. As much as he enjoyed his adventures aboard the Unreliable, the vicar known as Max eventually decided that it was time to move on, to live out the life he had sought so long to create. He knew there were many in the colony who carried burdens much worse than the ones he had struggled with, and he devoted himself to easing their suffering wherever he could. He only ever took up arms again to defend the defenseless. Unshackled from a lifetime of striving and fighting the universe and himself, Vicar Maximilian de Soto was finally at peace. Once the matter with the Hope colonists was resolved, Junle bashfully asked Parvati if she'd like to join her permanently on the Groundbreaker, and Parvati enthusiastically, if somewhat awkwardly, agreed. The stories of her adventures spread across the colony, and Parvati soon found herself the center of attention. Having served as the engineer of a renowned spacecraft, tramp freighters and wildcat miners sought her out by name. And in no time, she was a fixture in the Groundbreaker's mechanical ecosystem. She and Jun Lei were never far apart. Nioka returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Caron Group, a mercenary outfit of ragtag survivalists and wilderness experts. Anyone in need of a guide or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories could find her camping on the trail or clearing an infestation. The SAM unit that accompanied you spread awareness of the product line's superior sanitation and maintenance capabilities across what was left of the colony. This led to a boost in SAM unit sales. Did you know that SAM units are the longest lasting, toughest acting cleaning solution in Halcyon? Minister Clark was released from house arrest and his contact with you gave him a sense of renewed purpose and vigor. Once it became clear that no help would be coming from Earth, he threw his considerable efforts and talents into helping Halcyon manage the crisis before it. It was widely suspected that Sophia Akande was the true power behind Chairman Rockwell. However, after the riots on Tartarus, she was never again seen in the colony. Various theories circulated as to her fate. Some believed she boarded an interstellar ship capable of journeying to a distant colony. Others believed she died trying to escape Tartarus. Some few suggest she fled to Monarch, 
where she continued to live among a small band of loyalists. There is another theory which suggests that Sophia's encounter with you changed her, and she deliberately retreated from public view, but continued supporting the colony in secret. When Dr. Wells began reviving the Hope's colonists, he found himself with a sudden windfall of additional supplies and resources, courtesy of an anonymous donor. If Wells knew who his supplier was, he never told a soul. Chairman Rockwell served as the public face for the changes in Halcyon to come. Whenever you needed strings pulled or a voice to sell a policy change, Rockwell was only too happy to oblige. As for Dr. Phineas Wells, he spent his remaining years in his orbital lab. He eventually came to terms with his own past and was able to forgive the mistakes of his younger self by devoting his remaining years to serving the colony. Dr. Wells was able to revive many more scientists and engineers than he first expected, thanks to the additional batch of chemicals you stole from the Ministry. Wells never forgot about the human lives that were lost in acquiring these chemicals. In the end, Dr. Wells was able to save every scientist and engineer aboard the Hope. Over the next decade, nearly all of the Hope's remaining colonists were successfully revived. Halcyon saw a period of rapid technological and scientific advancement. Breakthroughs in dietary supplements saved the colony from starvation. Geoengineering projects and social reforms began to change the structure and character of the colony. Dr. Wells laid the groundwork for the project to save the colony, but he would never live to see the fruits of his labor. He passed away a few years later. His work was carried on by the scientists and engineers he revived. Today, Halcyon has stabilized. The people of the colony work hard to adapt to their new circumstances. Nearby colonies send aid and supplies. Life will never be easy in Halcyon, but for the first time in its history, there exists a sense of real, genuine hope about the future. And what about you? the unplanned variable in the history of Halcyon. Long after Wells passed away, you carried on his work with more energy, determination, and brilliance than he could ever muster. The years that followed were hard, but Halcyon survived by the efforts of the Hope's most promising colonists, the greatest of which was you. No one knows what's happened to Earth and no one knows what the future has in store for Halcyon. All we know for certain is this, the name of the unreliable and that of its intrepid captain will remain the subject of countless stories for years to come.